feet tall. I'm six feet. Six foot tall. I wanted to show you guys something. We've got so many good things in store. Um, man. I feel like we're actually coming to the um, manifestation of what God told me 24 years ago. And that's the taking of Clovis. And... Um, I don't even know where I'm going in my thing. Hang on. Let me gather my thoughts. <laughs> They're a little everywhere. Has anybody experienced any uh, spiritual warfare the last week? Right. You did too? It was intense. Like, I have felt overwhelmed. And I normally do not feel overwhelmed. So I just want to let you know, if you've been feeling that, I think we pretty much all have at some degree. If not, congratulations. <laughs> um, but you know, what that shows me is, you know, the enemy comes in cycles. And so uh, we're about to, you know, enter into a new, a new place. And, um, and I, I, whenever, he, whenever he does that, to me, it's like he's overplaying his hand. And uh, so it lets me know that we're close. Um, can someone pass these out? It, I think they're three pages long. There we go. And uh, this was um, a prophetic word. Have any of you guys heard of Doug at, uh, Addison? Okay. Um, he was uh, healed of uh, Huntington, Huntington's disease and uh, a lot of other things. Anyway, um, He's actually a Christian comedian, too, which is really funny. But normally I don't read his um, monthly prophetic words, not because I don't want to. I just don't have you know, a lot of time. There's so much I'm reading. But this one really caught my attention. And he said, time to recover it all. And when I read it, I was like, man, you guys need this. Yes. But one of the things that really spoke to me is... Can you guys think back to the year 2008? Okay, so picture it in your mind. Yes. 2008 was a disastrous, oh, yeah. horrible year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Now, if you didn't have that, again, congratulations. But for those of us that had the worst year in 2008, there was a lot of loss that me and Mike experienced in 2008. Uh, financially, his business halved. Um, there are just a lot of different things. Well, he says that on Sunday, October 19th, he awoke at 520 with an angel in his house, and God spoke to him saying that he is currently reconciling the books in heaven from 2008 and also the past seven years, and there are adjustments and repayments due to people because the enemy overplayed his hand. And so that really stuck out to me. And uh, so then he just has like several dreams and things. So I just printed this for you guys. Um, I plan on marking mine up and, you know, praying it over the next month, maybe even the next year, because I feel it's a very strategic word. So I just wanted to give that to you guys <clears throat> for y'all to pray over. And the thing, you know, with um, the prophetic is we have a responsibility uh, when we receive a prophetic word. Um, a lot of people are like, well, if we get a prophetic word, then that must mean God's going to do it. But there's actually, um, as far as personal prophetic words, we have a part to play in that. Now, in the Bible, there are words that, apart from us, He does. You know what I mean? Like Jesus being born, okay? Um, the end of the age, things like that. But even there, we have a role to play. So how do you cooperate with a prophetic word? And the way you do that is by, number one, praying it in faith. You know, what you read, pray it, or what you receive, pray it. Number two, get some scriptures that support it, if there's not any in the Word, and decree those. Uh, the Bible says, decree a thing and it will be yours. And uh, so, and then just being led of the Spirit, and just allowing Him to lead you. 
Uh, like, let me just give you an example that we I can kind of just play it out for you. In uh, gosh, we started the furnace 2012. So in 2012, me and several ladies sat down out here in Java Lock, and uh, one was Yolanda Villa and Christy Masterson, and uh, Corey was there um, at the time. But anyway, we sat down. And I said, you know, I feel like we guys need to have a wellness center. Like, I see us in the same building. And I didn't have my personal training. I didn't have anything. You know what I mean? I just really felt that. And we're talking about having a room where people could come in and soak as they're waiting for their appointments and, you know, it's all of that. Well, we are now all in the same building. Every one of us. And when Yolanda, <laughs> she goes in there and she's standing in the lobby a few weeks ago and all of a sudden she stops and she said, you told us this would happen. Here we are. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so now it's just allowing, you know, the Holy Ghost to guide us on the next steps. But that's what I'm talking about is like when I saw that a room was available to rent, I'm like, that's my room. And then I was told, no, it's not. And then I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm in the room. And then when the other room came up, we took that one. And so all of that is a design of what he's doing. Uh, so anyway, just make sure that you recognize opportunities. It's like your spirit will jump. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Like when God's doing something, he's highlighting it, your spirit's like, yes. You know, and then sometimes you have no idea. You just kind of stumble into it. <laughs> and then you're like, ooh. So, but look for those opportunities. Look for those connections because you're very, very important. Okay. Um, can we get one more light on? I think that last uh, on this side. This light on this one? Yeah. Anybody cold? I'm starting to get a little bit. My armpits are starting to dry out. It's making me cold. <laughs> I told Ramona one Friday, I was, you know, hugging her like this. I don't know what it is, but at the furnace, every time it's time to go, my armpits smell. So I'm like all afraid, you know, hug people. You know, oh, good night. <laughs> and I swear I've been the other So I don't know what's going on. I've missed Romans. So uh, we're going to go back into Romans, but let me give you a testimony for the treasure hunt. I loved the kids. That was my favorite part. Um, by the way, Mary Alice, uh, <laughs> you guys weren't here. Uh, Nancy, who was coming, supposed to be this Friday, you know, to minister and do treasure hunts, uh, called me last Friday and said, I'm here. Right. That's what I did. <laughs> and uh, so we kind of had to, you know, rearrange things. But it was so neat because uh, Luis and uh, Francisco, almost said Francisco, and I was like, no, that's not right. Francisco. Uh, so how old are they? Eight and nine. Eight and nine, okay? So we're all sitting at the restaurant, and how many are there, like eight? We're like, they put us in the corner booth. You know, so we're all eating like that. And uh, anyway, and then Roger from uh, Amarillo, he came down because we were supposed to practice, you know, for live worship there. Well, we had a treasure hunt, Steve. And so he decided to come down and do it with us. And so the kids are there. And uh, and so anyway, we you know, start getting our clues. And I was getting a little anxious. I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but it's like we had a book, you know. And I'm thinking, this is going to take four hours. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, the kids were getting clue after clue after clue. And uh, so I'm like, man, this is cool. So then when it was time to break up into groups, uh, Ramona was asking, okay, you know, who do you want to go with? And I was hoping we got at least one of the kids on uh, me and Roger's team. And Louise said, I want to go with her. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and so we all take off, and he's all quiet, you know. So how's it going? Good. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's, you know, let's go find our clues. So we found our clues, and he's just watching, you know. And So I didn't know what was going on in the inside of him, you know, like if he was thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life, or if he was really getting into it. So anyway, he's just following us around, and, uh, you know, I you know, tell him, I'm so glad you're with us, and you know, just different things. Anyway, so we get done, and we're all, like, in a semicircle, and everybody's sharing. And, uh, and what was amazing is every one of their clues was found. Yeah. Yep. And so when they, like they say, you know, got this clue, 
uh, Francisco, right? Okay, he goes, that was my clue. I mean, it was like they saw, you know, that they heard from God. So then, Maurice, said next to me, he goes, can I share what we did? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? And he methodically and systematically went through the entire thing. And I'm like, I couldn't have done it better than myself. And then he had one part. It was so funny. It was an awkward moment. Because we went to Walmart, because we weren't really finding many clues. And so I'm like, I know where some are. I always just go to Walmart. That's like, if I cannot find anybody, I'm off there. Well, uh, one was like a navy shirt and a red, a redhead lady, long hair, short and petite, and then a Hispanic lady with a shoulder length hair, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we walk in, there's a redheaded girl. And so Luis is telling about it, you know, so we go over there, we ask her if she needs for anything, and she's like, nope. And, he was, and it was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> That's what he said, <laughs> and awkward. And, uh, but then it was our clue to the lady we're supposed to minister to. Anyway, God has been downloading some stuff to me for the kids. And uh, so uh, I'm still praying about it. I, there's still some things I need to do. But this is what God told me. He said, if you will equip the kids, you will be positioned for the future. And uh, so and he, he's always told me the kids will be a part of the furnace. They will not be separate. They won't be in a room to be babysat and, and taught, you know, Bible stories. They will be active in it. And uh, so I was really just kind of pondering and rolling these things. I've had so many marbles rolling around in my head. It's like, oh, my gosh. And uh, so me and Shelly meet Tuesday, and she was talking about her son and how when we watch the Holy Ghost movie, he says, Mom, I want to do that. And so that was just me confirmation. Kids, um, they don't have any guile. Like they don't have, um, um, they don't have selfish ambition. You know, like they may be stinkers at times, but their hearts really are just primed to hear God. And uh, so anyway, it was great. Um, I had a blast and Nancy actually gave me some ideas for the kids and what we can do and things like that. And I'm like, gosh, it's, you know, kind of a duh thing because that's what me and Mike did with Kent, you know, so I don't know, you know, I've been kind of, I don't know. So, all right, we're going to get into the Word of God, but it was just neat. It was so neat seeing those kids. That was my favorite, favorite <clears throat> part. And their little faces, that was our glue. Mm-hmm. And like one of the clues, and this is really important because Roberta and Elizabeth were uh, together as a team, and I think it was Francisco that got a red wagon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was neat is that when they were in the park, they saw a red stroller, and so they knew that was his clue, you know. And I'm like, man, that's just neat because. You know, he may, like, he's describing what he's seeing, and he kind of had a rough time describing it, you know. And uh, and so I, I wonder if he was seeing a stroller. He just didn't know how to describe it, so he said red wagon. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was really a lot of fun. He described it, you pull kids. He did say that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He put kids in it. Yeah, it was pretty neat. All right, so we're going to start Romans 8, 9 through 10. Um, so Nancy, uh, I feel like she was to launch um, the evangelistic aspect of the furnace. I feel that's why she came. We also served a purpose in letting her know that she can minister to crowds. Um, and uh, tonight's offering, uh, I do uh, just no compulsion, but pray and see uh, what to give because um, she did come early. None of us were really prepared for that offering-wise. I only had about 50 bucks to give her, and she came on her own expense, and I can't give her 50 bucks. And uh, so just pray. Uh, toward the end, we'll do the offering and just see what God tells you, but don't don't give out of, you know, compulsion and obligation, but I definitely want to bless her. And um, anyway, it, it was a neat deal. It was a really neat deal. All right, so Romans 8, 9 through 10. Oh, and one more funny thing. When she got here, Kent had the mattress at his house to our guest bed. <laughs> and I was like, um, can you bring the mattress over? And he had guests, so he's like, sorry, I gotta take the mattress. <laughs> over to 
the house. I said, wash the sheets first. <laughs> I don't want them, you know, her to sleep on, you know, icky sheets. It was so funny. I wish I could have seen my face when she called, because I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what to do. Oh my goodness. Where did you come from? Arizona, oh, Tucson. Wow. Yeah, she traveled all the way over, and I've been trying to get her here for months. Um, so anyway, she just came a week early. Uh, all right, so Romans 8, 9 through 10. I love this chapter. It's amazing. And uh, so it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, um, I want to look at the word if in this um, chapter because it actually carries two meanings. And I'm going to read uh, a, another version of it in um, the least, or not the least, the um, Mirror Bible. But the word if can be conditional or conclusion. In other words, if you do your homework, you can have a cookie. Okay, that's conditional. Um, but to the Greek, it can also be you will have a cookie at the end of your homework, which is a conclusion, okay? And so what he's saying is, if Christ's Spirit is at home in you, okay? See, a lot of times people don't understand that the Holy Spirit, the way they knew the Messiah, John the Baptist, the way he would know is the dove would come and remain. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't do that. Um, he would come upon men. There were a few he was actually he dwelt with but typically he would come upon people and then he would lift and so like some of the uh, minor prophets in the Old Testament they lived their whole life and ministered maybe five months out of their entire life because that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them that's when they delivered the message and then they went back to work whether it's farming or whatever but now the Spirit is to come and abide and dwell in us and so that's what he's saying if you belong to Christ, you have his spirit. And then he says that the body is dead on account of sin, but the spirit is alive on account of righteousness. I personally do not believe he's talking about the physical body because the entire context of the last couple of chapters have been what? Do y'all remember? The body of sin, the body of death. And so what he's saying is that because we have the Spirit of God, because of the Holy Ghost, our old body of sin is, is dead. That's why a lot of people have a rough time following God to the fullest without being Spirit baptized. Now let me clarify that. When you're born again or born from above, you have your spirit comes alive by the Holy Ghost. You have a measure of Him or you wouldn't belong to God. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, He floods your inner being, and He's actually the power to say no to sin. He's the power to be transformed into agreement with the Word. And so that's why you can see people that have gone to church their whole lives, uh, they've never been Spirit-filled or anything, and, and they can be just jerks, you know? But on the other side, I've met a lot of Spirit-filled time-talking people that are jerks too. And the reason why is we do not understand that sin nature is dead. You know what faith is? Simple definition, one word, agreement. That's it. You agree with the word. Once your heart agrees with the word, then uh, you enter into a new place according to the promises. Now, I was kind of pondering that. I'm like, well, we can talk all night about how our old sin nature is dead, and yet... You know, sin. Okay? So I was kind of pondering it, and this is how the Lord described it to me. Jesus Christ was sinless, right? He never committed a single sin, yet he had to resist sin every day. So it is not sin to be tempted with it. See, that's where people are like, oh, I must be a bad person because I've been tempted to do this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The tempter is the devil. And so the Bible says that the enemy came and tempted Jesus. Uh, the servant's not above the master, right? So if he was tempted, we are dang sure going to be tempted. Bless you. But the reality is that because we have Christ in us, it's exactly the same 
as Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit in him, because it's the same spirit. In fact, his death was required so that he could give up the ghost. Remember that? He had to give up the ghost so that he could send him to us. So now the Holy Spirit lives in us just like he did Jesus. Therefore, as we walk through life, the enemy is going to come tempt us. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit to say no. Now, the way the enemy traps us or entraps us is typically by doubt. He, he knows. He knows where doubt and unbelief is. He can smell it. And so he'll come to you and he'll begin to talk to you and he'll begin to tempt you to get you to not believe God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into that a little more detail later. But if you've got the Holy Spirit, you can resist sin successfully. And then another way he gets us is by ignorance. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that they're sinning. You know what I mean? Like if I look back at the uh, movies I used to watch, you know, I didn't think anything about them. If I try to watch one now, I'm like, oh my gosh, number one, my parents should be fired for even letting me watch that thing. And yes, the Texan came out. I'm sorry. But number two, I can't believe I didn't notice how horrible it was when I was a born again Christian, but I was a baby. You know, so it's like kids want to stick things in, you know, sockets, right? We as adults, as mature people know, don't do that. Kids don't know. So ignorance is a way. And that's why it's so important for babies to have spiritual parents. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to raise a child, too. Mm -hmm. It is not the responsibility of the pastor solely to raise up ch children in the Lord. It's everybody. It's doing life together. Mm -hmm. And so if you guys think about it, right? We have all come alongside one another. Have y'all noticed that? All of us have come alongside one another. We love one another, and whenever we've been stinkers, we've told each other to stop. Whenever we've needed encouragement, we've encouraged one another. Whenever we needed prayer, we've prayed together. That's how it works. And so, anyway, uh, the fact is, is that doubt and unbelief, ignorance, will be something that the enemy can use. And here's another thing. Being sin conscious instead of God conscious. Whatever you focus on, that's what you become. And so if you're just focusing on what's wrong with you, if you're just focusing on your past, if you're just focusing on a sin in your life, you will remain in that state. But it's when you begin to focus on Him and your gaze turns toward Him through the Word and through prayer, then all of a sudden, you don't even think about sin. I mean, it's like, literally, I do not think about sin hardly at all. But really, the only time I think about sin is when I've been a stinker. <laughs> and then the Lord's like, I didn't like that, and then I'm sorry. But other than that, that's not on my mind. Unfortunately, the church has conditioned people that they're sinners. Even born-again people. And they use a the couple of scriptures that actually don't even mean that. So, here's a truth that you can take home. You are no longer a sinner. That's it. You're just not. It's unnatural and abnormal for you to sin. Now, some of you may be looking at your life thinking, I don't, I don't see it yet. Keep believing it. Keep focusing on it. I promise it will begin to take effect in your life. And so... The only way, guys, that the Holy Spirit could dwell in us, just like he did Jesus Christ, is he had to kill that old man. Mm -hmm. Because light and darkness can't dwell together. Okay? Uh, I, um, on my homework today, found something really interesting that he said. Let me see if I can remember. It's Dr. Arfouche. Yeah, 1 Corinthians <coughs> 6, 19 and 20. He was talking about how a lot of people will teach that healing's not for today or healing sovereign, you know, or whatever. He's redeemed us, and one day we'll have a body that's perfect. But on earth, we're going to catch colds and stuff like that. Well, he's talking about how healing is in the atonement. Uh, he said that a lot of people have more faith to suffer than they do to be healed. Mm -hmm. He was talking about how People think it's to give glory to God by enduring sickness when sickness is of the devil. It didn't come in until man fell. Mm -hmm. And that as sin is to the soul, sickness is to the body. That's what he's you know, talking about. And then he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, mm -hmm. whom you have from God? You are not your own. 
You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now what he's talking about is saying that Jesus Christ purchased your body as well. Your flesh that the Bible talks about, the fallen nature, is not your body. Okay? A lot of people are like, this old flesh of mine, you know, death dwells in its members, sin dwells in its members. No. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yours might be a temple of demons. Mine's a temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And I'm sure y'all met those. They have all kinds of demons manifesting, right? I told the other day, um, he's not going to change because he has demons, major, and he needs to be born again. <laughs> She's like, oh, you think? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, uh, the word temple, there were three sections to the temple. And you had the outer court, and then you had the holy place, and then the most holy place. That word right there is the most holy place. So where the Holy Spirit used to dwell between the cherubim on the ark, and only one man could go in once a year to offer the blood, that same spirit now dwells in us. And, and the word by means he purchased you body, soul, and spirit. That's why I'm actually so uh, passionate about health and wellness because we have uh, things to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys have all experienced where you're sick. Do you feel like praying? No. Do you have faith to believe the word? Nope. Do you want to go out and do you know, kingdom work? Nope. You know what I mean? You just want to lay on the couch, watch TV, right? The enemy knows that. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's like told the church, mm -hmm. oh, healing that died a long time ago. You know, and then he even went further to say, oh, it gives God glory if you suffer it patiently. And so, like, last week, I was feeling a little off. It was actually when Nancy was here. And so I'm like, no, you are not allowed to give me a cold. I would curse all of ours, you know, and just resisted the whole uh, weekend. That's what you have to do. Don't lay down and take it. Get up and fight it. You know what I mean? And so he, he purchased your body uh, on the cross. And then the uh, mirror translation says, we no longer need to express an inferior expression of life in our physical bodies. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. No longer need to express an inferior expression of life in our physical bodies. Where is that? Where is that Romans? It's the Romans. Mm -hmm. 8, 9, 10. Jesus said, in John 10.10, 10, that he came to give abundant life. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And another way, and I, I want to give you several ways, and you might write them down if you're taking notes. I want to show you how the enemy works. The first way he tries to come in to steal, kill, and destroy is like we stated before, unbelief. Let me read you. <clears throat> this isn't my notes, but I read this the other day. And it's Ephesians 2.2. 2. We were all part of a common pattern, swept along under a powerful, invisible influence. A spirit energy that adopted us as sons to its dictate through unbelief. And so I wrote my Bible, unbelief is the open door to the enemy's influence. All sin originated with unbelief. Okay, so uh, anger, gossip, whatever it is, whatever sin, um, basically, if you search it down, there's a lie you're believing. And so that's why I tell people, wherever you're having a rough time, search it down to the root system. The second way is deception. And the problem with deception is you don't know when you're deceived. And I told someone the other day, uh, I remember who it was, but I said, if you know the word truth, you'll recognize lies. Um, we don't recognize lies. We don't recognize counterfeit by studying those things. We recognize truth by studying truth, and then whatever is counterfeit uh, will expose itself. This is very, very important because uh, I have to be honest, a lot of churches are teaching stuff that's not truth. But it's, it's, it, it appears that it is. And that was one thing that 
Gigi and Mommy's, um, one of the first things they told us was in Acts. I think it was uh, chapter 19, and it says that Paul went to the Bereans, and uh, they listened to what he had to say with an open mind, but then they studied it. Amen. And so uh, what happened, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Dark Ages, right? Okay, the reason we went into the Dark Ages is because, and this isn't a bash against the Catholic Church, but what happened 